later that we would still be waiting to live peacefully in Eretz Yisrael, the land they were promised. Many of us, including the committed here and at home today, were caught completely unprepared for these attacks, which were then accompanied by a rise in anti-Semitism across the world. When I met with a sympathetic member of Congress to reflect with her on the crisis, I explained how personal violence against Jews is because of the very few degrees of separation that separate us. The yeshiva student in New York was nearly bludgeoned to death by an anti-Israel mob, was a high school classmate of my first cousin. Unfortunately, it's my sadness to tell you today that, from what I understand, the American Jewish community's response fell short. And it had results. My political contacts told me that the reason so few politicians were moved nationally to issue statements early on was because simply, quote, they did not hear from their Jewish constituents. And if what happens in Israel does not matter to us, it will not matter to them. And so it is with this sense of urgency in mind as we read in our Torah a struggle of the Jewish people in Eretz Yisrael to survive, that I invite our friend and synagogue past president, Norm Radow, to share some words of Torah with us this morning. Norman and Lindy were among the first to travel to Israel when the pandemic restrictions were first lifted to see their family. A lot like any of us might get on a plane to go see our family members. It just so happened that the day they arrived, if I remember correctly, was May 5th, 2021, days before the rockets fell. I'm not going to steal any more of Norman's thunder this morning, but I am taking time. You can see he's already biting at the chomps there, right? But I am taking time out of our regular high holiday schedule, and I will be speaking about Israel again tomorrow, because I want there to be no confusion about what we as a Jewish community must do. The Jewish community prides itself on being allies to so many. What happened this summer reminds us that we must become better allies to ourselves. Norman. Thank you, Rabbi. At the American Israel Public Affairs Committee Atlanta Annual Dinner, APAC, in January of 2020, I asked two questions. If an air raid siren sounded right now, one, would you even know what it was? And two, would you know what to do if you did? These were rhetorical questions because since I was a little boy, and learn to roll, to duck, and to cover. In too many air raid drills during the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, I'm dating myself, there's been no serious training for an aerial attack of any kind in America. I also told the APAC audience that in my son's apartment in Israel, like most modern apartments there, he has a safe room. It doubles as our granddaughter's bedroom. Its window is four inches thick and is angled to deflect shrapnel. There's a heavy steel plate that can be rolled over it. It's so heavy, it takes two adult men to roll it over, as I learned the hard way. The room has its own air filtration system in case of a chemical attack. And it broke my heart, I said, that anyone, li uh, that my little granddaughter above her bed is a child-sized gas mask. How could anyone live this way? And that anyone is my family, our family, the Jews of Israel. It's simply chilling that as the generation once removed from the Holocaust, our people need to prepare for gas, gas attacks. Given the fact we as Americans can't answer either question, could we recognize an air raid siren and would we know what to do if we did, it shouldn't be any surprise to hear our story. 
Lindy and I were having our appetizers at a kosher Moroccan restaurant in Nevet Zedek in Tel Aviv on the evening of May 11th. We heard barely a muffled siren outside. The ancient and thick walls of the restaurant had quieted those sirens. And those sirens were trying to warn us of a surprise and massive missile attack. Hence, we didn't blink an eye when we heard it. The sound meant absolutely nothing to us. But all that changed in an instant when the hostess opened the restaurant door and shouted, rockets are coming, rockets are coming. We have 90 seconds, 90 seconds. Hurry, we need to go to the shelter. We were startled at first, hesitated, but then pushed the table aside and joined the other patrons running as best we could. My physical limitations slowed us down. I was awaiting surgery on my knee and could, couldn't walk well. And people passed us as we scurried into the building across the street and then down three flights of stairs, down another hallway, down more stairs till we got to the basement in the bomb shelter. At each juncture, people ushered us to the next door or stairway. Everyone helped each other, but due to my injuries, I slowed people down. Some pushed me along, others pushed me aside. Just as we neared the bottom floor that served as the shelter, the sirens stopped. It became clear why a moment later. You see, when the sirens stop, it means the rockets are here. We heard not one, not two, but what seemed like hundreds of explosions, like that cacophony of symbols banging together at the end of Tchaikovsky's 1812 overture. Except this was no concert. It was war. It was real war. Moments later, the power of those explosions penetrated the concrete and steel walls of our bomb shelter. And we could feel those shockwaves penetrate our body. While the shockwaves were physically harmless, they were emotionally powerful. Lindy began to cry. Plaintively, she sobbed, they are trying to kill us, and she just lost it. I hugged her so hard, but even I was shedding a tear. Were our children okay? Our grandchildren? How about, how would we get out of here? Is our hotel still in existence? How are we going to get the kilometer to the hotel? These were some of the thoughts racing through my mind when my shoulder was tapped. Israelis surrounded us and reached out to Lindy to touch her in the most comforting way. This must be your first time, they said to Lindy. Everything will be OK. They gave us water, information, and allowed us to use their phones to call our loved ones. Ours were roaming and couldn't penetrate the steel and concrete walls. We finally heard the all clear. 130 rockets rained down on Tel Aviv all at once, a record designed to overwhelm Iron Dome. It failed as only a few rockets got through. We were halfway across the street to pay our bill at the restaurant, the only ones to do that, uh, when the sirens blared anew. Rinse, wash, repeat. We scurried back into our shelter. When we made it back up again, we paid our bill and offered the poor staff a very large tip. We realized the city was deserted. There wasn't a car in sight, let alone a cab. Walking was hard for me, but we staggered our way back to the hotel, literally clinging to the sides of buildings and staying very aware and listening for the next siren. It was the longest kilometer walk of my life. My fellow congregants, to know what that feels like can only be experienced if you were there. Luckily, we made it back to the hotel, and it was intact. It had to be. The name is the Hotel Norman. <laughs> we immediately asked to tour the bomb shelters. Then, emotionally drained, we went to our room and poured some scotch to settle our nerves. Okay, it was a little more than just some. 
Johnny Walker and I had a lot to talk about. We fell asleep in workout clothes just in case. Then at 3 a.m., the alarm sounded again. Our hotel was old, so the shelter was in the basement, four flights below us. Our heads were fogged, but we ran down the stairs, and we saw the thick steel massive green door and hurried in just as it was closed. We could hear the 30 or so explosions as clear as day, and then the shock waves. They were much stronger, as we were not as deep as in the last shelter. And we went back to our rooms in 15 minutes, and as soon as we got into bed, the sirens blared again. This is how Hamas creates terror. There's one more story I want to share with you, among many. The next night, our granddaughter slept with us. The air raid siren screamed its warning at 1 a.m., yet e even as veterans of four attacks by then, we were startled. We acted like two pinballs bouncing off the walls. As a result, we lost precious, precious seconds. Finally, I scooped our little granddaughter into my arms, and Lindy grabbed a pillow and a bag we had prepared. We ran down the stairs as fast as we could, and my hurting body would allow us, and two flights down, we were at the ground level, at the ground level landing. And there was the glass door to the courtyard on our left. And as we turned to go down the next flight, the sirens had stopped. We were too late. The rockets had arrived, and we were exposed. Iron Dome's intercept of Hamas's heavy rockets pierced the short-lived and eerie calm at that moment when the sirens had stopped. My, fr my friends, the most frightening thing a grandfather could ever experience is holding your little granddaughter in your arms as the sounds of war, the explosions of Hamas rockets are exploding all around us. I was overwhelmed with emotion. I am now too. Then we heard those holding the bomb shelter door open, shouting for us to hurry. And we saw the green steel door and ran as best we could behind it and then heard it clang shut. 15 minutes and 30 rockets later, we trudged back up four flights carrying our granddaughter, only to hear the alarm sound yet again moments after we hit the pillow. And that was just day two of the war. As the rabbi said, militarily, he said the rest of my speech actually, um, militarily, well, I'll, I'll, try to, I'll try to live up to it. Militarily, Israel demonstrated again its superiority, both defensively in protecting its civilians, protecting our, our grandchildren, and offensively, and in a war it did not initiate. But in the court of public opinion, it lost. And we should, and we must do something about it. The following month, Lindy and I were in Necker Island, Richard Branson's private island in the British Virgin Islands. We were visiting him with 10 other couples. All week, the famous Sir Richard would be feted and lauded and appreciated by his guests. And, and uh, you can just imagine every time he'd walk in, people go, oh, Richard. And um, he, he was uh, enjoying it immensely. One day, we ha were having a private lunch with Richard and his wife, Lady Joan. And she asked about our grandchildren. And I told her the story about me holding Morgan in an exposed area while rockets started exploding above us. Richard interrupted and retorted, imagine how much worse it was for the poor children of Gaza. Without missing a beat, I said, Richard, I agree with you. I can't possibly imagine a child in Gaza watching Israeli society, all of Israeli society, do everything to protect its children, when in Gaza, their Hamas-run society does everything to put their children in harm's way. I would feel terrible, too, as a Gaza child. That's not what I meant, Richard responded. He was troubled that someone not only questioned him, but also turned around his own point against him. And so began a heated discussion that Richard was ill-prepared to win. 
He was tongue-tied. No one apparently ever defended Israel to him before. Some people come by their anti-Israel stands through their politics. But way too many spew out their anti-Semitic rants thinly disguised in anti-Israel veneer. And we've been silent too long. We've allowed them to get away with it for so long that some don't even disguise it at all anymore. And it's no surprise, as the rabbi noted, that attacks against Jews even in our country, in England, in France, and elsewhere, and now one in, Aust in uh, New Zealand, um, are on the rise and significantly so. If we see woke reporting, minimizing, or justifying anti-Semitism, we need to stand up. When you, we see unjustified anti-Israel editorials or social media, we need to stand up. We're in Falcon's country, we need to rise up. I did not let Richard Branson's comments go unanswered. And the other couples were supportive of us. We're glad someone did something, they said. But they never did. We all need to be that someone. I urge you, I beg you, let the words never again have real meaning. Stand up for Israel and against all forms of anti-Semitism whether it's disguised or not. Now, I've answered the two questions I posed at the beginning. Would I recognize a siren if I heard it? And would I know what to do? But what if emboldened by our loss of the remaining world support for the Jewish people and nation, that our enemies used even more destructive weapons against us? And if they do, and they will, if they think they can get away with it, then my little granddaughter may need to reach for that children's sized gas mask for real. And that is a speech I hope I never have to give. Shana Tova. When it comes to the land of Israel, of course, Thank you, Norman, for those beautiful words. When it comes to the land of Israel, of course, hope springs eternal. And with this in mind, we pray that Israel, just like we in America, may have a better year than last year.